Welcome everyone to our webinar uh, this morning, COVID-19, Seizing Opportunities to Advance Indigenous Self-Determination Through Policy. This is part of our 2020 uh, Policy Salon. I'm Allison McFarland. I'm the Director of the School of uh, Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia, SPPGA. And this morning, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Musqueam Elder Larry Grant. Larry was born and raised in Musqueam traditional territory. He's presently assisting in revitalizing the ancestral language in the Musqueam Language and Cultural Department and co-teaching the introductory language course through UBC. Larry is the elder in residence at UBC's First Nations House of Living Learning. Larry, turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. My name is Larry Grant. Ayeslak is my Musqueam name. Our ancestor Kepalana was here to greet the first visitors off the shores of our lands. And as our ancestor had done in the past, I do today and raise my hand in welcome to all of you here on the webinar meeting for policy, uh, seizing our policy program here. I uh, just wanted to say that our ancestor, Pierpalano, was just down on the foreshore below the School of Policy at UBC and lived there with the warrior families and the warriors that were there defending the shores and the different areas of our territory and very much keeping things in place. Now it's very important that we keep that in mind that Musqueam was always on the mouth of the river, taking care of the control and control of the territories that we were living upon at that time. And today I know that with the policies that we have today, they're very discriminatory when it comes to uh, indigenous peoples. And I know that if we cannot change policy to reflect equity in all areas of indigenous wellness, then it will remain the same. So I really truly hope that we can seize upon this time frame with with the Truth and Reconciliation Recommendations to Action and also the implementation of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to be able to create policy that reflects equity in all of the services that we have, but not only a, a policy that reflects that, but a policy that has an implementation plan and a timeline for implementation. Otherwise, it, we just remain where they have us sitting at the moment and carry on with the status quo. Colette Gwansi Tietala, to swallow the Hui Namat, Hui to E, E, Kakip, to now whale, Tietam, E, Hilux Tala. When an eight tennis qualowan, Gwansi, the Slum Nala, Cornette, the eight Seamat, Seam Squalowan, because 
the site to Mukstem Hall, because that's what we told. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder Grant, for being with us today and for sharing these important lessons about traditional Musqueam lands and culture with us. We really appreciate it. The session is co-hosted by SPPGA, as well as the School of Population and Public Health at UBC. We're thankful for SPPH's guidance and support in crafting this year's Policy Salon, which is looking at the theme, the importance of good governance in the COVID-19 era from the local to the global. And this is certainly a global and a local issue. We're excited to bring this session to UBC students, alumni, faculty, staff, and the broader community today. At the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, our researchers strive to address urgent issues of the day through research and collaboration and explore policy responses. Our students in the Masters of Public Policy uh, and Global Affairs program are learning to analyze policy issues from different perspectives and test solutions in the classroom and beyond. Policy is a fast moving target, as we all know, and it's difficult to sometimes keep up with events. This pandemic has certainly been something that's affected all of us everywhere in the entire world. Nobody's been able to escape it. And our policy responses to it have been essential to our success or failure as humans. Uh, we're working to, at SPPGA, we're, we're interested in this issue, obviously, and that's why we're highlighting it today. And we're also interested in a number of other issues. We're really working hard to include more indigenous perspectives and content in our MPPGA curriculum and in our event programming and in the work that we do as scholars at SPPGA. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session, Professor, Professor Cheryl Lightfoot. Cheryl's a faculty member in SPPGA, as well as in the Department of Political Science at UBC. Cheryl is Canada Re Research Chair of Global Indigenous Rights and Politics, and she's also the Senior Advisor to the President on Indigenous Affairs at UBC. I wanna take this opportunity to congratulate Cheryl on her leadership in enacting UBC's historic new Indigenous Strategic Plan. UBC has become the first university in North America to commit to implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. With input from more than 2,500 students, faculty and staff across both campuses at UBC and the Indigenous community partners, the plan is also historic as it takes a human rights based approach to the strategic framework. Uh, it's a really fantastic accomplishment, Cheryl. Let me turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Allison, for that introduction and uh, an extra thanks for recognition of the plan. So many people's voices and efforts went into its creation and its development. And I know everyone is very excited to begin our new journey, which will be implementing that plan. And that's where it really becomes uh, important to all of us. And I want to just take a moment to uh, acknowledge the territory that I'm currently sitting on. Uh, due to some extenuating family circumstances, I am joining you from uh, the city of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I am at my sister's home. So this is uh, the traditional and ancestral ter territory of my own people, the Anishinaabe, and it is where we meet with our relatives and neighbors, the Dakota. So we call this place Mini Sota, which means land of blue waters. And so I am very pleased uh, to be here with you this morning from very far away. Uh, but due to the virtual world, that, that makes everything possible. And I just am reflecting for a moment because I am about two kilometers from the place where two very important rivers join, which is the Mississippi River and the Minnesota River. And at that space is one of our most sacred places in the universe. It's, it's our origin story coming from those two rivers. And so it's my honor and privilege to be joining you from this uh, very special location this morning. 
And of course, I'm very honored to serve as moderator this morning for this incredibly important discussion. And uh, as an Indigenous scholar who's very interested in Indigenous human rights and policy and self-determination, I have been watching very carefully myself how Indigenous peoples have been exercising their self-determination in an age of COVID. And so I am particularly privileged to be the moderator for this morning's discussion. So a, one housekeeping note before we proceed, I have to tell everyone and notify you that this webinar and the following Q&A will be recorded and are being recorded as we speak. By joining this Zoom presentation, we are not asking you to use your camera or microphone to participate in the Q&A session. We ask that written questions can be submitted to everyone with the Q&A function and upvoted by you. I will monitor the Q&A window and I will pose questions using attendees first names only. After the presentation, the recording will be uploaded publicly to the SPPGA website at sppga.ubc.ca. And this recording will not include attendees full names. So with that, I would like to take this opportunity to present uh, our speakers for this morning, our very distinguished speakers. First of all, we have joining us Dr. Danielle Bain-Smith, who is Deputy Provincial Health Officer, Indigenous Health, and has been working to support Indigenous Health within the Office of the Provincial Health Officer since 2015. Dr. Bain-Smith works alongside Dr. Bonnie Henry, Provincial Health Officer. Dr. Bain Smith provides independent advice and support to the Ministry of Health on Indigenous Health Issues. In support of the Ministry's strategic agenda, Dr. Bain Smith works in meaningful partnership with Indigenous collectives, communities, and organizations to advance wellness and to disrupt colonial practices and policies. She is H.O. Dene, Big Animal People of the Fort Nelson First Nation in BC with French Canadian Métis roots in the Red River Valley. Since getting her Doctor of Medicine from McMaster University and completing residencies at the universities of Ottawa and Manitoba, her career has spanned the country and the globe. She has practiced rural medicine in remote and First Nations communities across Canada. She was board director for the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada, the Director of Education for the University of Alberta's Indigenous Health Initiatives Program, and the Site Director of the University of British Columbia's Aboriginal Family Practice Residency. Since 2014, she has transitioned to a functional medicine practice. Functional medicine is a complex systems biology approach to family practice that resonates with Indigenous approaches to health and healing. And also this morning, we have joining Dr. Shannon Waters, who is Coast Salish and a member of the Sit Numinous for First Nation on Vancouver Island. She completed the First Nations Family Practice Program at the University of British Columbia and worked as a family doctor in Duncan, BC. While honored to work close to home, Shannon became frustrated with seeing people mostly when they were unwell and wanted to focus on keeping people healthy in the first place. So she returned to school and completed her specialty training in public health and preventative medicine. Shannon worked as the Director of Health Surveillance at First Nations and Inuit Health Branch and at First Nations Health Authority as the Acting Senior Medical Officer for the Vancouver Island Region. She's worked with Vancouver Island Health Authority as a medical director and with the Ministry of Health as the Aboriginal Physician Advisor. She is honored to have come full circle and to be working in her home territory as the local medical health officer with Vancouver Island Health Authority. Dr. Waters is a clinical assistant professor with the UBC School of Population and Public Health. So without further ado, I would like to turn the mic over to Dr. Bain Smith. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much, Cheryl. And I'm just going to begin sharing my screen so that we can get started in a good way. Hopefully 
that's all working there. So um, thank you so much to um, the, the Policy Salon for inviting us to join you this morning. And thank you certainly to Elder Larry Grant for your welcome and words this morning and um, for really crystallizing for me exactly what we're here to talk about, which is disrupting the status quo in policymaking. So um, Shannon and I, I'm very grateful that Shannon um, is here with me this morning and we'd like to start in a good way. So for us, that means um, acknowledging where we're joining from and then introducing ourselves. So I'm very grateful to be joining from the territories of the Lekwungen peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Um, I'm very, very uh, pleased and grateful to be an uninvited visitor working and raising my family on these beautiful lands. Um, as mentioned by Cheryl, I am Echo Dene, from Fort Nelson First Nation and my paternal grandparents are George Bain and the late, Bar late Mary Bain. Um, je suis aussi Franco Manitoba Métis de la Rivière Rouge, so I'm also French Canadian Métis from the Red River Valley and my maternal grandparents are the late Lucienne and Gédéon Sumen. Um, I'm a mama, a daughter, a wife. Um, these are my two uh, beautiful daughters, Lucienne and Maeve, and that's a photo of my father, Richard Bain. And as Cheryl mentioned, I'm very privileged to work as the deputy PHO for Indigenous Health in BC's Office of the Provincial Health Officer. I will pass it over to Shannon to um, introduce herself. Oh, Ait Neitat, good morning. It's a uh pleasure to be here with you all this morning and um, likewise thank you to Elder Grant for um, uh, opening and grounding us all in such a great way. A few words about myself in before we share further with you. Um, as um, had been introduced, I am Hawk Meetnams, um, Coast Salish on my mother's side from Stamanis First Nation here in Vancouver Island and a lot of family ties to Cowichan tribes. Um, Actually pictured here on the left are my great great grandparents Lestim and Jenny George, who are pictured in front of the um, Clem Clemelet's big house with an anthropologist Gigi Hayde, who was traveling through our territory in the late uh, um, 1800s. Uh, at, at the bottom below that, you'll see um, uh, I can see this mountain outside of my window here this morning as I'm presenting from home. <laughs> I am. Um, uh, also a mama. Uh, so the two girls pictured there are both home here with me this morning since they've got coughs and are home from school and daycare so they may run in and out uh, occasionally. I've told them I'm doing a presentation but uh, they are curious so may pop in. Um, so I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I um, have the incredible honor to work within my home territory of the Cowichan people. So yeah, uh, Mount Swakas there pictured in the photo at the bottom left is where some of our first people fell from the sky to the base of that mountain. And um, yeah, just have the tremendous um, honor, privilege and challenge of working within a colonial structure as a medical health officer with Island Health um, and with, um, you know, uh, legislative authority underneath the Public Health Act, which is very much front and center when we're in the time of um, dual public health emergencies here in this province with um, the overdose crisis and COVID-19. So I lean on um, my Western academic training and also the teachings and knowledge and wisdom and gifts that I've received from you know, those who have come before me, including um, pictured at the top right here, one of my dear aunties who's now passed away, um, but my auntie Sandra. So just acknowledging the many things that have brought me to be here sharing with you this morning. Thanks, Shannon. Um, it's always so nice to see your beautiful family. Um, so throwback Thursday on a Friday and circular learning. I just um, wanted to share um, a couple of photos. So these photos go back all the way to the spring of 2002. Um, Shannon and I graduated from different medical schools, but at, at the same time. And um, 
I wanted to share this with you because I wanted to kind of contextualize what it is that we're sharing this morning. And today, I think for us is really just a continuation of a conversation that we've been having for close to 20 years now. Um, so I think, um, as was mentioned in our biographies, we both came into medicine um, with the hope of supporting and promoting health and wellness in our own communities and other Indigenous communities and um, have progressed Aggressively moved farther and farther upstream. And so we've really talked about that tension filled space between um, biomedical models and Western mainstream ways of knowing and being and um, our own histories and teachings. And so I want to share with you a quote from another friend and mentor of ours, Margot Greenwood, who's also been a part of this ongoing conversation. And for me, it really captures the essence of what um, we're here to discuss today. And so Margot wrote in an email a few weeks ago, the fundamental premise here is that different systems of knowledges exist in the world. The oppression of one over the other is what we face on a daily basis. This oppression is held in place by societal beliefs, structures, policies, and practices. Ethical space brings knowledge from multiple sources together to create something new and relevant to contemporary situations, ever evolving, ever changing, just like the elders teach us. And so the way that we propose unpacking this a little bit further is I'll take the next sort of 10 to 15 minutes to lay some conceptual groundwork. Um, and then I'll pass it back over to Shannon and we'll have a bit more of a dialogue about some of the real world examples and the way that we're bearing witness um, to these tensions between knowledge systems through the pandemic. So some of our shared beliefs include being healthy and well means being in harmony and balance in mind, body, and spirit, and with all of our relations. Um, and to note, the, the image that was on the opening slide is an image by Christy Belcourt called Our Lives Are in the Land. And for me, it is the most beautiful illustration and grounding in this teaching. Humility, gratitude, respect, ceremony, land, language, and food are good medicines. Self-determination is the key determinant of health. And structural and systemic Canadian colonial practices and policies undermine and interfere with our ability to be healthy, vibrant, and self-determining. So I want to share this image with you, which is um, a product of a collaboration between the Office of the Provincial Health Officer and First Nation Health Authorities Office of the Chief Medical Officer. And I'm sharing it because I think it's another representation, visual representation of the teachings I've just shared, and really helps to illuminate um, an ecosystem of First Nations wellness um, that's governed by natural laws that I think are also represented in Christie's beautiful image. And so this work um, actually began in 2005. At 2006, there was a tripartite First Nations health plan that directed the provincial health officer to monitor and report on the health of Aboriginal people um, every two years and look at seven core indicators, um, the majority of which were very um, downstream health outcomes. At the conclusion of that first 10 years of reporting in 2015, um, the CEO of FNHA at the time, Joe Gallagher, brought the two teams together and um, put a challenge before us, which was to create a new suite of indicators that was expanded, that was grounded in the First Nations perspective of wellness, that was strengths-based and holistic. And so what emerged from that work is this ecosystem conceptualization. Um, so I want to walk you through it because I think um, it's really important to understand this in order to really unpack the rest of the conversation. So we asked ourselves two very fundamental questions. One is, what do First Nations need more of to be healthy, vibrant, and self-determining? And the second question is, what do we need less of? What are the things that are getting in our way? 
And then we leaned very heavily on the work of Dr. Charlotte Lopi from UVic, who has used a plant metaphor to um, describe indigenous determinants and structural determinants of health. And with the help of Sam Brad, a graphic visual artist, this is the image that came out from our discussions. And so what this image really does is it makes the distinction between health outcomes, so all of the people and the medicines that you see on top of the soil, and uh, makes the distinction with those contrasted against determinants of wellness and what we're calling roots of wellness. And so what we realized um, is that what we need at the deepest roots of wellness is um, to be ourselves. All the things that make us distinctly hok aminim, echodene, meiti, anishnabe, tunaha, tlingit, stolo, and the list goes on. So that is our culture, our language, our lands, our nations, our communities. We need the freedom to be ourselves truly in order to be um, healthy and well. And then in the slightly shallower soil, um, depending on where you're viewing the screen, you may or may not be able to see um, into that shallower soil, but what that represents is supportive systems. And that's really speaking to mainstream settler systems across the board, education, health, justice, food, housing, uh, child and family development. We need all of those settler systems to be culturally safe, free of racism and discrimination, and socially inclusive. We need to see ourselves in those systems. We need to be able to interact with them in a good way in order to have our needs met. When those roots of wellness are well nourished, we flourish we thrive and we have a restoration of our holistic health in mind, body, and spirit. And so the reason I wanna share this image today is because I think it helps locate us as policy implementers, policy makers, and really helps us understand our relation to this holistic understanding of health and wellness. And so, um, we really are in that shallow soil and we have opportunities to radically transform and disrupt um, the status quo policies. And so the next important question to reflect on then becomes um, the what and the why of, of needing to disrupt that status quo. And so to ground our understanding of that, I just wanna share the next image, which is by Cree artist Kent Monkman. And I just, I love this painting. Um, it is part of an art installation that he was commissioned to do for Canada's 150th um, birthday. And the installation is called Shame and Prejudice, A Story of Resilience. And this painting in particular is called The Daddies. And it's a recreation of a Robert Harris painting entitled The Fathers of Confederation. Robert Harris was commissioned to create the original painting to honor the Charlottetown Conference, which was one of three conferences that ultimately led to the Confederacy of Canada. Um, as I under this, understand the story, when Kent Monkman saw the original painting, he was struck by uh, an empty footstool in the foreground of the painting. And he saw that as a really um, critical opportunity to illuminate the absence and deliberate exclusion of Indigenous peoples at that very pivotal moment in our shared history. And it's important to um, really understand that we were excluded from that moment in history because of these um, different knowledge systems and the very widespread, um, wide held belief that European ways of knowing and being were superior to that um, of our ancestors. And so another way we could say this would be that there was a very widespread ideology of white supremacy. And I know that that language uh, can be challenging. And for a lot of us, that conjures up images of very extreme individuals or groups that um, hold um, very abhorrent uh, values and views and that do very extreme things. 
Um, and I'm very confident that there's no one in our virtual circle today that would stand up and raise their hand and say, well, I believe that white people are better than other people. Um, and I'm sure most of us would agree that um, skin color, race, ethnicity doesn't inherently make somebody better or worse, lazy or not. But that rather um, simplistic idea that everyone is com is created equal falls down a little bit when we look at data and so um, if we do in fact believe that all people are created equal we have to find a way to understand this type of data so this is uh, a chart that's taken from that initial 10 years first 10 year reporting cycle i referenced earlier and so what it shows us is that other residents of BC can expect to live eight years longer than a person who's identified as an Indian by the Indian Act. And I do want to acknowledge that the way that we present this data is inherently problematic. Um, in epidemiology, we are typically studying risk and risk factors, and we're comparing groups with exposures to different risks. So we're often comparing um, smokers and non-smokers, drinkers and non-drinkers. And when we present Indigenous data or data regarding Indigenous peoples, there's an implicit attribution of risk to indigeneity. And I think it's really important that we unpack that a little bit more. Um, if we want to understand or make sense of this disparity in life expectancy, we have a couple of different options. So one would be that we could um, rely on some sort of genetic basis and we could um, believe that there's something inherently weaker, um, less robust about Indigenous peoples. And of course, we have um, lots of Western scientific evidence now that disproves um, that theory. Another way to explain this might be to focus on health behaviors and come to the conclusion that Indigenous peoples lead riskier lives, that maybe we don't take as good care of ourselves. Um, and again, if we peel back that superficial layer, that's actually just another way of making a judgment about our character or our morals and has this insidious um, positioning of uh, white uh, or settlers, other residents, as being um, somehow better at taking care of themselves than Indigenous people. And so both of those um, explanations obviously are quite contrary to the idea that we're all created equal. Um, I'll say again that indigeneity is not a risk factor. So um, being Echodene, being Métis, being Hulk Aminem, being Tunaha, being Stolo, um, being Carrier, those are things that give us strength and resilience. Our teachings and our ancestral connections and our um, medicine that we find in the lands and nations that we come from, those are all things that help us to stay healthy and well. They certainly aren't things that, um, that uh, create health disparities. So if we want to reconcile the other belief, we do need to understand that what's being measured in this type of data is really the impact of being subject to Canadian colonial practices and policies. And so if we want to um, move forward with that, then obviously it's critical that we disrupt status quo policies and uphold Indigenous peoples' rights. As has been mentioned, BC is already on a path to that by legislating the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And so that brings us to COVID-19 and some real world examples. And so what I would say is that um, Shannon and I certainly believe that COVID-19 is creating opportunities to advance Indigenous self-determination and policy um, if, there's a big if here, <laughs> if we can embed cultural humility and two-eyed seeing into our processes. And so this image that I'm sharing is by um, Dennett bioethicist Lisa Boyven, who works out of the University of Toronto. And this for me is our end goal, and, and uh, I don't think we're there yet. But this beautiful image really anchors me and illustrates both the work that we need to do and the how of how we need to do it. So um, the first piece of the work we need to do is to recognize different systems of knowledge. Um, secondly, we need to activate that intersection between those disparate worldviews in a good and ethical and respectful way. 
and we need to create new ways of moving forward in these contemporary situations, just like Margot said, by bringing um, our hands together and um, joining these multiple diverse worldviews. And then in terms of the how of doing the work, um, to come to this intersection humbly and respectfully, I think what this image does is it helps me remember that by um, differentially sizing these spheres. So you'll note that the biomedical sphere in this image is smaller than the indigenous sphere. And I think we really do need to be mindful of that and bring that humility um, and deliberately shrink our um, settler presence and when we're having these dialogues and conversations and relationship building, um, when we're coming from a settler um, perspective or system, we need to talk less and listen more. So those are all of the pieces around the conceptual groundwork that I wanted to share. Um, and now I'll pass it back over to Shannon to offer some reflections about how this is playing out in, um, in our day-to-day -day work right now in COVID-19. And, um, and then we can move into the Q&A as well to hear from all of you. Masi. Uh, I just got Danielle. Um, it's interesting um, listening to the context that you um, laid because uh, I think you and I, it, it's kind of like what we're, we're dealing with in, in the day-to-day, -day, always I think in our work, but at, at even an accelerated pace since uh, March and the declaration of uh, pandemic. Um, a lot of, what you were speaking to uh, needs the time and the space to, um, you know, be done in a good way, to be thought out for relationships to be built. And, um, and there's an additional challenge at the time when things are happening really quickly and there's fear. Um, I can say in March and April, uh, you know, I had, I think, more, you know, kind of fear or, you know, s s there's unknown in my work all the time, but there was the amount of unknown that was suddenly like mounting, you know, in February leading up to March um, was really at times, you know, very overwhelming. And it was, um, I've, I've, been in public health um, at the time of H1N1, the um, uh, pandemic that we had not that long ago, uh, you know, a number of years ago. Uh, but I wasn't a, a medical health officer in my home territory at that time. And it was interesting to be part of um, really a medical health officer. Like even, you know, the title is very, um, you know, authoritarian and, uh, implies a, a lot of things and how how do you you know be in this space in this, this time of uncertainty and fear uh when you're you know your role daniel and my role has has a lot of um responsibilities that are laid on it from within the colonial system and yet we're also women who are, are trying to do that in the best way with you know the teachings and the context and the relationships that we have so i always appreciate when you put up um you know pictures or illustrations because i think they capture these things often so much more richly than can be put into words and um you know in in terms of of you know the last diagram there uh by lisa boyvin yeah, I think how, how, how do we approach that, look at that, live that as communities, as people in roles who are trying to support our communities in a time of, you know, uncertainty and fear. And it's not that there hasn't been uncertainty and fear previous to our generation. I, I find myself reflecting a lot 
on um, you know, my ancestors just even 200 and 250 years ago. So much change in the world, so much unknown. Again, situations of fear, um, contagious you know, diseases, deaths, um, concern for our families and loved ones. How do, we, how do we take care of them? And really at that time, I think because of the joining together of um, you know, ways of, of, of knowing, of at least the, the, the intersection of the ways of knowing how, how did my um, you know, ancestors take you know, bits of pieces of knowledge from both those systems for what they were being faced with and challenged with. And so that's what I try and you know, approach some of these you know, dilemmas that can come up you know, on a daily basis. And I think we'll get into a, a bit of a question and answer, but I'll, I'll just reference one such conversation I had um, earlier on this week. So um, I live in, in North Cowichan. I said earlier, I'm a Stamina Span member, but I have a lot of family ties with Cowichan tribes as well. And um, Cowichan has recently prepared a document that's been signed by some of our spiritual leaders around, especially in the winter season, is when a lot of our ceremonial gatherings happen as Hokkaitan people. Um, there's memorials coming up. I have a memorial actually for my auntie who is, who I shared that, um, uh, you know, had been a great teacher for me. Uh, there's a memorial for her that had been planned in February. Typically, that's a large gathering where people come together. Um, and how does that, that look? How, how, can we, how can we do those spiritual practices we know that keep us well in this time when it looks like we're going to have to do that quite differently to help protect, you know, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health. And so there's been, um, you know, an agreement that the spiritual leaders within uh, uh, Cowichan and the um, chief and, sorry, here comes my daughter. As it, okay, come here for a second. So anyway, there's been, a, there's been an agreement that's been signed. <laughs> okay, hang on, honey. Can you give me a minute? To <laughs> of course. Yeah, no, you... Um, take care of Atira and uh, maybe while Shannon's doing that, I will um, just take a moment to share some other concrete examples in the way that Shannon was, um, because there've been so many that have come up um, and the, created these tensions. Um, one really obvious one as Shannon was referencing is the timing um, and, and the urgency of uh, pandemic policy and direction. And um, clearly that timing um, doesn't really support uh, meaningful partnership and meaningful engagement, especially in a status quo structure that doesn't currently have a great governance structure around the policy making process in a way that aligns with DRIPA. So I would contrast that to data governance principles, Indigenous data governance principles that I think have actually been very well um, embedded in, in BC. And so even through the pandemic, we have examples where um, we are getting distinctions-based COVID data. So First Nations and Métis and First Nations Health Authority and Métis Nation BC are both um, the recognized provincial data stewards. So we're, we're seeing the impact of having governance that supports um, a relational and meaningful partnership way forward. Um, and so, um, so I think that, like I say, I think there's opportunities, but it's falling down in the places where we don't already have that established governance. Um, it looks like you're back, Shannon, so I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Danielle. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I was speaking to this conversation I'd had earlier this week, this written agreement that had been um, established between uh, political leadership in Cowichan and spiritual leadership. And um, so I've, I've really, one of the ways that I've tried to, you know, navigate this time is really just touching base and having informal conversations and allowing those informal conversations to be, um, uh, have a rhythm to be fairly frequent. And so I, I am not a spiritual leader. I am not a political leader in my community. I'm a community member who cares about the health of us all. 
and I also have this title in a Western academic system as um, a medical health officer. So as we were kind of talking through some of what had been in the agreement and it spoke to things that have become very much part of all of our lives now, uh, you know, mask wearing, uh, physical distancing of two meters, washing hands, individuals who might be coming to uh, you know, a gathering, you know, screening to make sure no one's symptomatic, and also um, taking the names and numbers of individuals who are at a ceremony so that we can get in contact with them later if we need to, if someone becomes a case. So all those are things that are maybe not necessarily the way you know, uh, ceremonies had happened previously there's certainly places within ceremony I think that m many uh, nations or groups would you know there would be cleansing at certain parts of the ceremony which is not that different but you know certainly that this looks different and um, it but it's not it it's not uh, if it's a, it's if it's part of a conversation we can talk with each other about you know how these how these differences to keep everyone well can can happen in a a um, respectful way to 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 still keep health moving forward. And so w then then this uh, this agreement had been coined, and I wasn't part of the conversations. And then there was just like a really practical question around you know fifty people being available or being able to be at, um, at a gathering and. As many of us know, there's often far more than 50 people at a gathering. And it's not like you're sending out an invitation to only 50 people and only 50 people are showing up. It, it's much more fluid. And so there was the ask around, you know, practicalities. If, if there's 50 people there and a certain number of people leave, can more people come? And just, you know, kind of walking through some of these very arbitrary things like 50, you know, it, it's a number. Like, you know, and, and, and how do you practically like look at that? And I mean, I've had this, you know, thought in my mind as, you know, things go on, like, you know, how do we arrive at these numbers? But the, the question was, you know, oh, so could we, if four people leave or eight people leave at one part, can another eight people come? And uh, just in having that conversation, I, you know, is just like stating, well, you know, we, we, we arrive at these numbers because we want to try and keep it at a level that if there is, you know, someone who ends up being uh, having COVID at the <laughs> gathering, <laughs> that uh, we can try and limit the numbers of um, people who need to be contact traced, limit. And so just through explaining that, um, we can arrive at places where we understand why we're putting things in place. Sorry, Danielle. No problem. I, I also want a donut. <laughs> um, thank you uh, so much, Shannon. And I think what, just as you're, you're describing that, I'm of course thinking of a lot of the concrete examples of, um, of, how things have been playing out for us at, from the office of the provincial health officer and and i think what's so critical is this paradigm shift um and um and we've been working really hard to get this message out to our public health teams around the province that when we're thinking about indigenous peoples one we need to be distinctions based so um you know first nations metis inuit we need to understand that that um and within first nations each um distinct nation is going to have its own world view so we need to go in with that mindset but we also need to shift our thinking from um, thinking of uh, indigenous communities as being a vulnerable population that needs our help like that creates a very different dynamic from coming into those conversations recognizing us as indigenous peoples as right holders and that we uh, can set up these conversations in a way that as Shannon is doing as the local medical health officer is coming Coming to those tables respectfully um, and saying this is the advice that I can offer from you know our Western public health training and in BC that those Western public health measures have worked in a lot of ways so you know we've got the that um, 
that kind of evidence to look at. And we're here to provide advice, but the nations and the communities are the decision makers. And that's where there's kind of been some rub and some friction. Um, and I would say that where I've seen um, things work out in a, in a good way or where th that tension has been resolved more successfully is exactly as Shannon's just talking about, where there's an opportunity for um, the different partners to come together. And so, um, although it's not ideal to have um, necessarily an emergency operations center, an EOC established because all of a sudden there's a case or cases in a First Nations community, what I've witnessed is that that EOC does create um, an opportunity for a dialogue, for communication. And I think although there's definitely been some bumps along the way, um, for the most part, I think the EOCs that have been activated in response to nations um, have, have ended up being able to incorporate the wisdom and local knowledge and incorporate community members in those teams to really collaborate in a meaningful way with um, public health. So I think there are areas where things are going well, but it still definitely is falling down in, um, in other areas where we're not able to get together and, and have those, um, those conversations to build relationships. Um, I noted, um, or it's been uh, noted to me that we're a little behind schedule. So um, if it's okay with you, Shannon, maybe we can move into the Q&A and, um, and just hear from folks that have joined the circle this morning. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Danielle and Shannon and Shannon's daughters uh, for joining <laughs> the presentation today. Um, I, I, I welcome children in the circle. It's always uh, wonderful to hear their voices and, and have them be a part of our conversation. So please thank them as well, Shannon. Um, I'm going to start out with a couple questions and then we are starting to get some through the Q&A. So I'd like to encourage people to post their questions there and we will try to answer each and every one of them. And I think the first question coming through is from Anonymous, which is fine. Uh, and I believe for Danielle first, but maybe Shannon will also have some additions to this. Can you tell us more about how we might incorporate two-eyed seeing into health practices more broadly? Yeah, so I really feel like, like I mentioned earlier, that's kind of an anchor for me and, and certainly in our office, something we've tried very hard to, um, to embrace in our processes. Um, I will note that, um, again, uh, elder knowledge keeper and mentor Margot Greenwood um, has flagged that two-eyed seeing might be a slightly limiting term in that there may be multiple disparate worldviews at play, especially when we're thinking about those distinctions-based approaches. So I just want to plant that seed for folks. And I think um, really one of the um, ways that we're trying to bring that is through attending to that process of cultural humility. So in every encounter, every space that I'm in, whether it be a clinical encounter, um, whether it be a policy meeting, whether it be uh, a team meeting, we're collaborating with FNHA and Métis Nation BC on um, three different um, health reports right now. And so if I'm thinking really practically about what does that look like applying to eyed seeing in those um, venues, it's really about me suspending um, my uh, biomedical training and expertise and holding that back um, and privileging, whether it be First Nations or Métis um, expertise and knowledge. So for example, in our health reports in the population health and wellness agenda, we now have 22 indicators. We have different sections. Every section of that report, which will be launched in the next few weeks, we've made a deliberate and intentional choice to have every opening paragraph share First Nations perspectives on that particular topic. So every, the rhythm, the pattern of, of that conversation leads with First Nations. 
And so I think those are the ways for us that we're trying to embody that approach. Um, and, and through the pandemic as well, we've really, um, you know, worked hard to um, resist the, the legislation and all of the powers that come along with a, declaring a public health emergency. And uh, one concrete example of that would be um, security checkpoints and information checkpoints. So many of you may be aware that early on in the pandemic, um, uh, over 70 nations, and I'm, I've maybe more than that, um, restricted movement in and out of their communities to prevent COVID-19 from entering their communities. Um, that's not an approach that is used in Western public health. Um, in Western public health, we uh, tend to restrict movement as an intervention of last resort. There's a policy um, through Emergency Management BC that um, reimburses communities for expenses related to emergency management. Um, and one of those um, stipulations in that policy around security checkpoints requires um, public health or the medical health officer to direct or sanction um, those checkpoints for nations in order for them to be um, eligible for reimbursement. And so as an example, that's an area where we said, well, that, that's not really a two-eyed seeing approach. Um, nations are self-determining. They have knowledge and expertise and wisdom and ways of approaching uh, emergency management that differ from the Western public health. And so this is a real tension where we've now created this hierarchy of who is determining whether or not that's a valid intervention. And so we've had very frank conversations with the nations, with EMBC, and we're working to um, pull public health out of that conversation um, to say, we, we think that nations, um, you know, are, should rightfully be the people that um, and and collectives that make that decision. So that's a long winded way of saying we just trying to go into spaces and just really be mindful that um, we need to hold our knowledge and expertise in check and create space and privilege um, the knowledge and expertise of the indigenous rights holders that we are working with. Shannon, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. A bit, but it probably could weave into some of the other questions that are um, posted, so I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Thanks, uh, Danielle and Shannon. And I'd like to ask one, which is related to some of the questions that are coming through the Q&A. So I'm going to try to condense them into a single question. Um, and they have to do with DRIPA and the ongoing work um, that we are all engaged with in implementing DRIPA and its pathways and how we can look ahead. We are, of course, in an election cycle. So I'm um, going to ask both of you, uh, and no matter which government uh, comes um, into fruition in the next few weeks, it will be charged with producing a provincial action plan to implement DRIPA throughout the province. And so could we get your thoughts and most importantly, your practical advice to the next government in, in picking up this piece of ongoing work? Do you want to lead that one, Shannon? Sure. Okay. So, yeah, I think, I think DRIPA is um, a real opportunity. And so in speaking to someone who um, uh, has been at um, high levels within First Nations health organizations recently, um, he spoke to the fact that, you know, politics can create space and then, you know, it's up to organizations to fill that space. And so I really, um, uh, have been thinking and Danielle and I have actually been looking a lot at, at working and thinking together about DRIPA and the opportunities that it um, puts before us. Maybe I'll use an example here other than COVID in that, um, you know, one of the other areas I have jurisdiction as a medical health officer is in water and specifically drinking water protection. And drinking water protection from a Western viewpoint looks at source protection, uh, dr drinking water treatment, and then drinking water distribution. 
So a lot of times when we're looking at, um, you know, things that might happen in the environment that could be a health to water, we're really only looking at it from, in my frame as a medical health officer, from a human health perspective. But as Indigenous people, um, like water is connected to everything. And so really for me, uh, the source protection aspect of drinking water is so critically important and an area under the Western system that really has no, <coughs> is, is, is the least looked upon, the most kind of not held by anyone. And in fact, I think one of the areas we haven't had the movement that we need. But if we, so, so if we now have the DRIPA Act, which says like we have to um, protect the rights of indigenous people with all legislation across the board, I think the Drinking Water Protection Act actually becomes something quite different because we are protecting our water as indigenous peoples because we have a relationship with it. We have a responsibility to protect it. And also it, we, water is not only there for us, it's there for the plants, the animals, it's there for itself. And so like it, suddenly it takes on a very different approach, which I think, you know, helps protect our rights as indigenous peoples and actually helps to deal with some other issues that are affecting, you know, our world, our country, you know, the planet. So I think there's some real opportunities in this next while because it's, it's needed because of legislation and it'll push some things that haven't been able to be pushed essentially since, you know, the, the picture of the daddies that, that Danielle shared with us. Thanks, Shannon. And I think just what I would add to that um, is yes, absolutely such an exciting opportunity. The implementation is really going to be the piece that um, that can create that transformative potential that's within the act. And I had the um, privilege of spending a little bit of time with Deputy Minister Doug Call from the Ministry of Indigenous Reconciliation and Relationships on um, a meeting last week. And I was it was really interesting to hear him talk about the creation of DRIPA and how um, they really got, went outside their comfort zone. They used a different process. They, um, in terms of drafting that legislation, they worked in very meaningful collaboration with a number of First Nations um, uh, rights holders and representatives. And it was different from the way that legislation's been created before. And so I think for me that really reinforced um, the, the procedural aspect of meeting the potential of DRIPA that we need to pay so much attention to the process in terms of how it gets implemented and how those action plans are created and carried out. Um, and that we have such an incredible trust deficit with Indigenous communities, collectives, and organizations as a settler institution in government. And so we have so much work to do to um, demonstrate our cultural humility and trustworthiness. And so it's going to take time and it's going to be bumpy and we just need to make and hold space for that and then fill it, as Shannon had said, um, with the, the right parties. So yeah, the process to me is just so critical. Thank you both for, for those comments. I think they are tremendously rich and, and helpful. And um, I appreciate the aspect of procedure being so, so important to especially indigenous peoples, not only in this province, but everywhere. And uh, so that's a key learning to take forward. I'm gonna ask the next question and it's picking up again, a few themes that are coming through the Q and A chat. And also a bit reflective of my own recent experience in developing the Indigenous Strategic Plan here at UBC. And as Allison mentioned, when we were developing the plan, we heard from 2,500 members of the UBC community. So we gathered a tremendous amount of comments and input, actually 15,000 comments and input in total. And uh, what 
all of those comments revealed to us was two important things that we now have to contend with as we move forward with a transformational model for the university. And I think these are also reflected in the healthcare sector as well. I think you'll, you'll find these to be very common. On the one hand, like you say, we have a strong trust deficit uh, of Indigenous peoples with Western settler colonial institutions. The health sector is one, UBC is another, and there are many, many others like it. And then we also discovered uh, uh, what this process revealed was a very clear and incredibly troubling pattern of both overt and systemic racism throughout our community. And I think we can see that we know it's happening in the healthcare sector where there's an investigation ongoing right as we speak on this very topic on this issue on the provincial level. And I'm wondering if we could gather your thoughts because there are significant challenges here in fighting both overt racism and the comments we received uh, through our process, like I said, were deeply troubling. And we've seen those also in hospital emergency rooms as recently as this week in Quebec. And, but then also the systemic pieces and how we can go about this incredible challenge of shifting from that deficit-based model in our thinking to more of a rights-based, strengths-based self-determination model? And I know that's a big question, but if you can just pick up different parts of it, uh, I'd really love to hear your thoughts. Shannon, do you have any thoughts or do you want me to get the ball rolling? Uh, Okay, I'll say something to begin with. Um, I think I'll just reiterate some of what um, Danielle had spoken to in the beginning around data and in indigeneity being a risk factor. Uh, um, and, and how there, there's systemic uh, discrimination, racism, uh, basically set up from even like what we report on. And so there's so much of it that, um, you know, points to, you know, even how we speak in that indig indigeneity is a risk factor. And I think some of the things we actually need to start measuring, and I've, so I've challenged Island Health to this, is like, we don't need to be measuring per se, um, you know, how many, you know, Indigenous people have X condition or Y condition. And we now have a First Nations Health Authority within BC that can do that. What we actually need to do is measure us as Island Health in terms of processes we have in place that set up those systems of systemic racism and what we're doing to change that. So, and, and I haven't seen, um, you know, any health authority, you know, sharing those numbers yet, but I think that's where we need to get to and changing the focus on us as indigenous peoples needing to do something differently to the system needing to do something differently. So um, yeah, just some thoughts I'd share and interest in your thoughts too, Danielle. Yes, thank you, Shannon. And I completely couldn't agree more that um, like it's so important that we start reframing that data so that we understand that the data that was presented earlier in the presentation actually has nothing to do with indigenous peoples. That's entirely a reflection of Western systems and the social exclusion and oppression of Indigenous people. So I think the more that we can start shifting the conversation, the better. Um, I would say, I guess I would just share this story with you that um, the day that uh, Minister Dix uh, announced that the investigation was going to be started by Mary Ellen Terpelafon, I had, I happened to have a meeting with, um, with Dr. Henry that morning, that's my name drop. My daughter would be so pleased. She loves that um, I work with a celebrity in her mind. Um, and so I had a meeting with Bonnie and um, there, was, there was actually uh, another sort of First Nations related media that had been planned for that day. And so she said, actually, you know, we're not going forward with that. And we are, um, Minister Dix is going to be making this announcement because of this disturbing, um, you know, story that's come forward. And she described to me about um, this game that was being played in the emergency departments around guessing the blood, blood alcohol level of Indigenous um, 
people who were there seeking care. And um, I was so cynical. Like my immediate reaction was like, why, why is this news today? Like this is something that's been happening for um, 20 years as far as I know, because I witnessed it as a medical student. I witnessed it as a resident um, in two separate provinces, three separate institutions. Like to my mind, I just couldn't wrap my head around why um, this was news today. It brought up in me and triggered so much of my own um, pain and shame of thinking back on those particular instances and um, what I didn't do, what I didn't say um, to um, in that moment. Um, and then, so I was processing all that emotion all, all day long. And then at the end of the day, um, I ended up sending Bonnie an email because I, I thought, you know what, um, even though I started the day just feeling so heartbroken, hopeless, um, helpless, hopeless, and just completely disheartened by this um, because it felt like nothing has changed, nothing is changing. But then all of a sudden it occurred to me, I was like, well, you know, here we are in 2020 and somebody experienced that, they, they witnessed that, they had a place to come forward and tell that story, to have it heard, and then to have these channels of communication that actually brought that story to the attention of our Minister of Health, and within 24 hours of him becoming aware of that, we have this investigation that's being launched. And so that is absolutely different from, you know, my experience in a Winnipeg hospital 15, 16 years ago. Um, so things have changed. Obviously, they are not changing fast enough. And this, both this overt and systemic racism is killing us. It is literally killing us. Um, so this week's story, of course, has been obviously very um, triggering as well. Things need to move more quickly. And um, in speaking to some of the people working on the, that racism report yesterday, it was brought to my attention, you know, we're still in this, um, in this way of working that it's the burden is still on us as Indigenous peoples to investigate, to prove that this is a problem, to bring it to the attention of settler um, stakeholders, and then of course to propose solutions about how to do that. So I mean we are still bearing um, the, the burden of the problem itself, but then all of these other pieces as well. And so um, it's time, obviously, for settler systems and allies to step up, step in, um, in a respectful way, and um, start solving their problems. Because these issues are not ours. Like, they hurt us, they're killing us, but these are not our problems or issues to solve. So um, I will just say, I think that we have an incredible um, amount of settler allyship in our leadership right now. And that's what I've witnessed through COVID-19. And I think um, certainly Bonnie Henry has been an excellent ally, as have many others. So I think there's a lot of pieces that are primed right now. And I hope that the um, election that's happening as we speak will um, allow that momentum to carry forward. Must see. Thank you, Danielle, and I, I appreciate your comments, especially because the topic is very emotional and it's, it's hit a lot of people very hard this week in particular. Uh, I want to shift just a little bit. Uh, there are a couple questions coming through the chat that I would like to touch on. And of course, we are a school with a global vision. So I'd like to talk about um, how the learnings here in BC might travel and, and what implications this might have for others uh, with other cultural health ways like uh, South Asian medicine, African traditional medicine, Chinese traditional medicine, and in, uh, in many ways these are also colonized in, in the world of health. And are there specific openings uh, that, that the BC case can bring and learnings for other contexts? Um, yeah, I'll, if it's a, huh, 
Shannon, if it's okay with you, I'll just take the first crack at this. Um, so I um, had a, an opportunity to participate in a documentary series way at the, when I had just finished residency and we traveled around the world learning um, with Indigenous healers and knowledge keepers about diverse Indigenous medicines. And we actually started our filming in Wales and Ireland. And, um, and we're looking at Celtic um, traditional healing uh, practices. And what really struck me um, was that, you know, we're all indigenous, obviously. We're all rooted to a place. This globalized world that we live in now is something that's really new in the grand scheme of, uh, of humanity on the planet. Um, and actually for most of us, our great, 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 great grandmothers had similar understandings about living in balance with the world around us. That was a necessity um, because my belief is that we're all governed by these same natural laws. And so um, even though the ecosystem metaphor that I presented earlier in the presentation is specific to our work um, and collaboration with First Nations health authorities, so by definition it, it is um, First Nations, um, I think that's a model and a metaphor that resonates um, with many different groups and, and I'm basing that on my experience and having uh, an ability to work with um, and the opportunity to work with different groups. So um, I absolutely think that that the work that's happening in BC can inform what's happening in other places. And similarly, the work that's happening in other places can inform what we're doing here in BC. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave my comments there. And I guess the only other thing that I would add is um, in finding those commonalities with um, other groups, other peoples that have had um, their approaches to healing, their ways of being, being, um, you know, discriminated against, you know, targeted or oppressed as well, that we can find, um, you know, strength in dealing with, you know, as, you know, Danelle, you know, expressed, you know, like there's an, you know, there's an onslaught daily, weekly of, you know, you know, tragedies and um, injustices uh, in we're and we're only in the area of health like it's across other se sectors as well but it's in through I think forming and seeing those common experiences that helps give us you know I think strength um, for the days that are you know undoubtedly going to be very tough and um, you know help keep us resilient to try and uh, continue this work moving ahead well thanks to both of you and I'd like to uh, ask now a question that comes out of our collective COVID experience uh, in the last six plus months. And the question is, are there particular learnings that we have now about how all of us, but particularly First Nations communities are able to connect in ways that are normally face-to-face -face or in-person interactions, particular support networks, what have we learned uh, through this experience about how we can transition some of those traditional practices uh, into online spaces and keep those connections, which are so important to so many? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Cheryl. And um, I would say that, um, I mean, everybody's doing their best for sure and it's it's a challenging time to to find ways to adapt um i've been really inspired and have so much admiration for the work for example of the bc association of aboriginal friendship centers that um you know right at the outset of the pandemic had a huge surge in demand for their services um and at the same time was receiving um you know uh really no new funds at that time um, and there was you know an inequity in funding and yet in spite of that found creative ways to deliver supplies and um, and resources to elders and finding ways to you know communicate with elders safely through um, screens and things of that nature um, moving some of their programming into virtual areas um, I'll say that even um, Shannon and I and a few of our um, uh, 
Indigenous sister colleagues have found a way to connect every second week and that's been such important and good medicine for me connecting over Zoom with um, with other like-minded Indigenous women and finding and gaining strength through the pandemic just knowing that that space is there um, being held for um, for us. And um, I think, you know, Shannon's comment around, I've been really amazed at how nations have um, come together and found extremely um, creative ways to conduct their, their you know, uh, general business, but then also um, adapting um, their ceremonies or their protocols um, to operate just more safely at this time of a pandemic. Um, so I'll pass it over to Shannon. One thing I'll add, I guess, is that, especially when it comes to some of those um, discussions that Danielle was just speaking of where it's um, about, you know, cultural, spiritual, ceremonial um, aspects. I found that really what I got to do is reach out with, with, a, with a phone call, like one-on-one -on -one or a couple people. And because sometimes some of these group spaces that have been developed, um, you know, Zooms or what have you, um, sometimes for some individuals, like, creates barriers to like speaking about you know a question that they might have that maybe you know does especially delve into that spiritual ceremonial type um area because it, this is an unfamiliar space and while we can use it for certain things it sometimes doesn't feel safe to everyone and doesn't have the same type of um maybe uh feel to it so really that reaching out one-on-one -on -one by phone calls and having specific conversations I find is something that I am have having to lean more towards and that it helps um, you know kind of still create those ways for relationships to um, keep going be built upon when you know we can't see each other face to face as easily Thank you both. And we are quickly running out of time. So I'm going to close by combining a couple questions in the chat uh, into, I think, a good place to leave off this discussion. And I'm going to ask, because the students and, and the faculty members are asking, what can they do to advance some of the important work that you're talking about here as students at UBC and as members of particular faculties at UBC? What sorts of advocacy and allyship are welcome and appropriate? Do you want to go, Shannon, or do you want me to start on this one? Okay, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I've got some ideas. Um, you know, I think for me, having been on this um, journey of reconciliation within the biomedical space, really since I started my career in, in medicine, that, like that's been the space that I've occupied the whole time. The fundamental learnings for me is that if, if, if we're creating change, um, meaningful change, it's uncomfortable. So I would encourage people who are starting out in this path to um, make yourself a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Get into conversations and spaces that you aren't normally in. Um, do that in a respectful and humble way. Um, so as Shannon and I did in, in the beginning of this presentation, we introduced ourselves. Like that's such a simple thing, really, but it's something that we don't typically do um, in settler systems and approaches, we typically give our name and then we tell people what we do, our kind of professional identity. But as Indigenous peoples, we want to know who you are, where you come from, who are your people. Um, uh, in New Zealand, I loved um, their phrasing is like, what water are you? So. Um, being willing to be vulnerable and, and introduce yourself in that way is even such a small gesture, but gesture, but really shifts the dynamic and cre can create trust. Um, the other thing I would suggest, so being uncomfortable, really everything that you're doing, just kind of pausing and, and thinking, am I 
reinforcing the status quo here or am I disrupting the status quo? Because those are the only two options. In reconciliation, there is no neutrality. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. It's again, quite simple. So if you're approaching a paper, if you're approaching a briefing note, if you're approaching a new policy and your process is exactly what it's always been and similar to what it's been in the last you know, 50 years, that's a problem. So you know, reflect on that and try and um, find um, people who can help you who are maybe farther along in their journey um, to give you um, thoughts and pointers and then the last thing I would just say in terms of that uncomfortable um, discomfort that we experience, um, that's inevitable, like that's going to happen and you will find yourselves in situations as you start to do this work um, where no matter what you're doing and trying, you just are hitting this wall and it's really hard to build relationships and the trust deficit is so great um, that um, yeah, that it's hard to see a way forward. And so I would say just keep coming back, like keep coming back to the fire, to the circle, to the table, whatever words you want to use. Um, and just keep doing that in that um, respectful and humble way and, and make yourself vulnerable. Just say, you know, I, this doesn't feel like it's going in a good way. I think somehow I'm making missteps. Like, can you, can you help me? Um, I think uh, that can go a long way, again, just from personal experience. Um, thanks. I'll let Shannon um, share some thoughts. Yeah. Shannon, I hate to tell you, but we have less than two minutes. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just say, um, what I think is that, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of work to do here. It can be very overwhelming. Um, but, and here, I'm here today with a mom with two kids, but we all, I think the other thing I'll just add is we all have our own gifts and we all need to be in our gifts to make this change that we need. So it's not up to me to do everything. It's not up to Danielle to do everything, but we have our roles. I never would have guessed I would have been a medical health officer, but here I am. And there's things I can do in this role. And um, we need everyone else to be acting within, you know, the gifts that they have to help bring this all forward. And yeah, here's Isis. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Shannon. And thank you, Danielle. I want to just take the last minute to express my appreciation to you both uh, as speakers today for sharing your work with us, sharing your thoughts, sharing your advice for us as, as scholars and policymakers and, and members of the public. I think this is all important messaging that everyone should be hearing. I want to thank everyone who's participated, who spent this time with us this morning, for taking your time and, and investing your time and energy into this conversation. And so I also want to say a special thank you to all of you who posted questions in the Q&A. Uh, we had many more than we could answer individually, so I did my best to try to combine them into overall questions. And I want to thank the speakers so much for your thoughtful responses to, to those questions. And uh, with that, I will close out this particular webinar and wish everyone a very wonderful Friday and a good weekend. Thank you so much, Cheryl. All the best. Bye. Thank yes. you. It was.